it's time to take another look at the heart. In part one of chapter 18, we looked at the anatomy of the heart. Now we'll dive down in and look at the cellular structure of the heart and how the cells are arranged and connected. And then we'll zoom out and look at the control of the heart cycle. How is the heart able to contract in precisely the way it does and, and do so repeatedly without any alterations? So here we see cardiomyocytes in this micrograph. You can see the striations of their sarcomeres. They're acting a myosin film is the way they overlap in such an orderly way. The dark um, smudges are the junctions where the cells are stitched end to end. These are short branched cells and they're stitched together end to end. And in those, those intercalated discs, they're called, are lots and lots of desmosomes that anchor the cytoskeleton of one cell to the cytoskeleton of its neighbor and its very tough connections. In those intercalated discs, discs are also gap junctions. So that if one cell happens to depolarize or have an action potential, um, ions from that have entered that cell can cross over into the neighboring cell and depolarize that cell. So depolarization waves spread from cell to cell throughout the heart. Uh, basic properties of the heart. Um, automaticity. There are pacemaker cells, not the same as the muscle cells, but a different type of cell called pacemaker cells that just spontaneously depolarize. If you just watch their membrane potential, it's not steady. It continues to depolarize until it reaches threshold. There'll be an action potential or repolarization and then do the whole thing over. So these cells just rhythmically, periodically have action potentials. And because of the gap junctions, those action potentials will spread to the muscle cells. It'll spread from cell to cell throughout the entire heart. And for that reason, the whole organ contracts as a unit. All you need to do is introduce one action potential into one cell and it'll spread throughout the entire heart organ and the heart will contract. That's called a, a heart cycle. <clears throat> Differing from skeletal muscles, heart muscle cells have a long refractory period. Instead of a few milliseconds, it's around 250 milliseconds. And that's an important thing, as we'll discover later. So the pacemaker cells are seen here in yellow. See them all in yellow. All of those yellow lines are like a wiring harness made up of, 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 of intrinsic conduction system cells, they're called. They're all pacemaker cells. They differ slightly in their properties. All the muscle cells are drawn in pinks. The actual contractile cells that do the work of pumping blood uh, are shown in pink, the myocardium. <clears throat> so the pacemaker cells are, are quite different from what we've learned about in, the, in other excitable cells, and we'll take a look at that. Well, let's just review briefly um, the fact that all these cells have a negative resting membrane potential. Why is that? They'll have a negative charge on the interior. Step one. All of these cells, or idea one, all of these cells have sodium potassium pumps, which create concentration gradients or differences. There's a lot of sodium outside the cells, not much sodium inside, right? It's 140 millimolar outside, 15 millimolar inside. There's a lot of potassium inside the cells, 140 millimolar there in the inside, and only five, 4.5 or five on the outside. Um, that's because the pumps are pumping sodium out and potassium in all day long. Well, at rest, the, the membrane is more permeable, that's the second thing, more permeable to potassium than to sodium. So these little purple channels represent some pathway by which a few potassiums can leak out of the membrane at rest, and they will do so because there's this huge concentration difference. And there's a few sodiums that can leak in, but not nearly as many, because there's not as many pathways. So the net effect is, positive charges leaking out of the cell, leaving behind a net negative charge. We start out with an equal number of charges inside and outside the cell, and we let some positive charges escape. We're going to have a net negative um, balance inside the cell. So we've got a resting membrane potential of around minus, minus 70 millivolts. Um, we can stimulate the cells with that resting membrane potential. Here we see a graph showing a, a muscle cell even more negative, minus 90 millivolts or so which is actually not unusual for a heart muscle cell. And if we trigger an action potential, ions may be passing from a neighboring cell through the gap junctions, we'll trigger an action potential and be this rapid depolarization of the, of the muscle cell. <clears throat>
That's because of sodium fast channels, the same kind of sodium channels we've seen on neuron axons, on skeletal muscle cells, right? Sodium channels open, sodium ions rush into the cell and depolarize it. Well, then those sodium channels inactivate, just like we learned before, but the cardiomyocytes have a different channel, one that we've not encountered before. It's a calcium slow channel, it's called, and the, now these calcium channels are open. They stay open for a long, long time, hence the long refractory period. So those calcium channels are letting positive charges into the cell, keep, keeping it depolarized. It's called the plateau period. So the cell, cell stays depolarized, got lots of calcium inside, it's contracting all the while. So the heart is contracting and doing work all the time so that we see this plateau. And then finally those calcium channels close, potassium slow channels open, and repolarize the membrane as potassium ions leak out of the cell. So that's the look of, a, of an action potential in a cardiomyocyte. So repolarization due to potassium channels opening. Now, let's take a look at a pacemaker cell, completely different um, electrical properties. So the pacemaker cell starts out with a negative resting potential of, say, minus 60 millivolts in this illustration. And slowly, the, the cell is depolarizing spontaneously, just constantly depolarizing. It never has a stable resting membrane potential. Why is that? It's because potassium channels are, are, are closing potassium leak channels are closing and sodium channels are opening. So slowly we're letting less positive charge out, letting more positive charge in. The cell is depolarizing until it reaches threshold and boom, it has an action potential. Interestingly, the action potential is due to the opening of calcium channels, electrogenic calcium channels instead of, uh, instead of sodium channels in this case. There's not, there are no sodium fast channels in these pacemaker cells. There's calcium channels. The cell has an action potential and depolarizes. The calcium channels close, potassium channels open, and repolarize the membrane, and we do it all over again. So they constantly depolarize to the threshold, have an action potential, and then repolarize and so forth. So rhythmically, periodically, these pacemaker cells trigger an action potential. So let's put them in the context of the heart. The, the fastest depolarizing pacemaker cells are found in what's called the SA node, the sinoatrial node. They just get there first. And we said that whenever there's an action potential uh, initiated in the heart, it will spread to the entire heart muscle, and that's exactly what happens. These guys just beat everyone else to the punch. So these cells have an action potential, and it spreads down through the atria, through the muscle of the atria, these little dome-shaped units, spreads right across both atria, and they contract and push blood down into the ventricles. The wave of depolarization then reaches the, oops, I went too far too fast. The, the wave of depolarization reaches the AV node, the atrioventricular node, and the wave of depolarization spreads from cell to cell through this pacemaker tissue, but it takes a while. It's an intentional delay. It's like a little timer lasting about a tenth of a second to give time for blood to move down from the atria into the ventricle. Moving massive blood takes time, and so that gives us the time we need. Then the wave of depolarization spreads into this AV bundle. The thing about the AV bundle that's interesting is we said there's a slab of collagen, a wall of collagen around the four heart valves right here between the ventricles and the atria. Well, it turns out they're also an electrical insulator. So there's no electrical signals that can pass from the, from the atria to the ventricles except through this AV bundle. Unfortunately, the way this, heart, this, this drawing is drawn, it looks like the muscle tissue from the atria just continues right on down into the ventricles. And you say, why wouldn't gap junctions continue to carry action potentials down? Well, it's not an accurate drawing. I do some black lines in here to illustrate that, no, the wave of depolarization cannot pass from the atria to the ventricles here, only through the AV bundle. And then the wave of depolarization spreads to the bundle branches, the right and left bundle branches, and then finally to the Purkinje fibers, which are all these little branchy things uh, that, that insert the, the action potential right into the heart muscle at, at strategic locations. So that's called the intrinsic conduction system. This is what controls the sort of pattern of depolarization in the heart muscle cells such that we get an efficient pumping. We can't just have the wave of depolarization spreading any old way because it wouldn't 
pump blood. We need to start the wave at the apex of the heart and pump the blood up and out of the ventricle. And all of that is orchestrated by this intrinsic conduction system, not only the pacing, but also the pattern of depolarization, but where the wave of depolarization goes. <clears throat> So the wave goes from apex to base. So the, all of the pacemaker cells have this property of spontaneously depolarizing to threshold. The SA node cells naturally depolarize to threshold about a hundred times a minute. If you just let them do their thing, they would just they would come up with an action potential about a hundred times a minute, 110. If we just isolated out the, the, the AV node cells, they would reach threshold around 60 times a minute. So similar properties, but a slower pace. AV bundle, these cells that make up this yellow portion right here, they have a, na a native pacing rate of around 30 to 40 beats per minute. So they're, they're similar, but they take longer. If you look at the SA node cells, they reach f starting from, say, a starting point at this at the beginning of the y-axis, and it takes till right at the zero point to have an action potential. Well, if we look at the, the AV node, those cells, if they were on their own, they would not reach threshold for another uh, quite a few milliseconds. They're slower. They pace slowly. <clears throat> they don't get a chance to do that, of course, because the wave of depolarization produced by the SA node spreads right down to the AV node through the, through the atria and on down. So the fastest depolarizing cells are the SA node, and therefore they are the, the pacemaker. Well, if we connect a very sensitive voltmeter to the surface of the body, again in strategic locations, we can watch that wave of depolarization passing through the heart because your body has a lot of ions in solution. It represents, those represent good conductors, and so we can actually um, watch the electrical events happen in the heart uh, over each heart cycle. If we do so, we see this familiar pattern. This pattern, this chart, is, rep is called an electrocardiogram. It's like a telegram. It's the information coming from the instrument, the electrocardiograph, that's going to let us look at the, at the activity of the heart. And there's a lot of clinical diagnostic value to studying this pattern as we look at, the, at someone's heart. So let's see what we've got. We start out at baseline where the whole heart is resting. During this time, the SA node is depolarizing. Right about this, where the zero mark is, the SA node has an action potential which then spreads through the atria, and as the wave of depolarization spreads through the atria, it creates this, this peak, this deflection called the P wave. Once the atria are completely depolarized, we return to baseline because there's no differences anywhere, uh, as there's no wave traveling through the heart, and then eventually, the AV node will pass the signal down to the a, through the AV bundle to the bundle branches of Purkinje fibers. So what we're waiting for in this baseline here, this little space between the, the P wave and the, and the QRS complex, is the AV node timer. Once the wave of depolarization enters the ventricle, it produces this huge deflection, because now we're talking about a major league number of heart muscle cells, way more than the atria, and so there's a lot more sort of electrical difference as the wave passes through we get this big QRS complex. Then the whole ventricle remains depolarized for a long, long time, right? We said that the, the plateau phase lasts for a long time. The cells are all depolarized. Calcium is entering. Cross bridges are cycling. The heart is contracting all the way until finally the, the calcium channels inactivate, potassium channels open and repolarize the ventricles. So the T wave represents a wave of repolarization of the ventricles. And now we're back at baseline. The whole heart is resting. The whole heart is repolarized. And we're waiting for the SA node to initiate another heart cycle. <clears throat> you may want to write in a few more notes to yourself on that. These, these names down here that you see at the bottom are just clinically um, defined periods of time that are often used to diagnose problems in the heart. The PR interval. What if it takes too long for the, for the signal to get through the AV node? That's a fairly common abnormality called an arrhythmia. I'm going to look at those in a bit. What if the ST segment is not the right length, takes too long? It's another diagnostic indicator of a heart problem. What if the ST segment shifts upward? 
this flat baseline shifts upward or downward. ST segment shift, that's another important finding in analyzing heart function. So anyway, QT interval, another one. <clears throat> I don't know if we'll get back to talking about the QT interval or not, but these are just things so you'll, you'll recognize those terms. They'll be familiar because those are important in cardiology and studying the, the function and the health of the heart. <clears throat> so just a quick review. These cartoons help us see what's going on. The SA node spontaneously depolarizes and has an X potential and it spreads through the muscle cells of the atria, forming the P wave of an electrocardiogram. Then there's a period of time when we're waiting for the wave to pass through the AV node, slowing it down like a timer, right? We see this little green line right here. The AV node is conducting the action potential through, and finally the action potential shoots down through the AV bundle, the bundle branches, the Purkinje fibers, and into the muscle of the ventricles. And then the ventricles have a wave of depolarization that gives rise to the QRS complex. Then when the whole ventricle is depolarized and contracting and doing work, that's represented here in this ST segment right here. That's the period of time the heart is contracting. It takes time to push blood up and out of the heart. Time to eject blood. And then finally, the heart, the ventricles repolarize and it forms this T wave right here. As red represents repolarization in this cartoon. Uh, illustration. And once the whole heart is repolarized, then we have this flat baseline again. And what are we waiting for? We're waiting for the SA node to depolarize the threshold and start another heart cycle. So that's a quick um, review of the electrocardiogram, one single heart cycle waveform uh, produced by someone's heart. So here we see a series of, of waveforms, the identical waveforms produced by a rhythmically beating heart, which is the normal finding. Right? We have P wave, delay, QRS complex, delay, and then T wave. <clears throat> it's called the sinus rhythm, and it's called that because the sinoatrial node is, is the controller, is the pacemaker of this rhythm that we see here. So there could be a situation, however, in which the SA node is not pacing the heart any longer. It's coming from, if the SA node stops functioning, the AV node will take over pacing the heart. This is called a junctional rhythm, right? The junction between the atria and the ventricles is the AV node. And so we don't see any P wave. Once the AV node has an X potential, it shoots down into the ventricles along that intrinsic conduction system. We have a QRS complex. We have the, we have the, the plateau period and the, and the T wave, the repolarization. So that's an abnormality. Think about what the pacing is going to be. AV node can pace the heart, yes, but only at 40 to 60 beats per minute. And unless you're a soccer player or something, that's not going to be enough blood flow for your body and you're going to have some problems. <clears throat> another thing that can go wrong, another type of arrhythmia, is called AV block. If it takes more than, say, 0 0.15 seconds for, this, for the wave of depolarization to get through the AV node, that's called first degree AV block or heart block. Something's wrong where that little neck of between the AV node and the AV bundle, uh, to get that signal through there, it's being inhibited somehow. Uh, maybe there's some damage to the tissues. Maybe there's some hypoxia in there. AV block. Second degree AV block means that the delay in the AV node and the AV bundle is so long that the SA node already reaches um, threshold and has another action potential and triggers another P wave before the ventricles are ever even involved. So here we see a P wave. Let's take a look at this P wave right here. We have the P wave and we're waiting and waiting. The ventricles are still not contracting. The SA node fires again. We have another P wave, but finally the signal from the first P wave has gotten through the AV node and the AV bundle and we have a QRS complex. So we have this extra P wave in there. That's a classic hallmark of second degree AV block. Third degree or complete block means that there's no correspondence between what's happening in the atria and what's happening in the ventricles. The SA node is still firing and triggering atrial contraction, but the, the, the QRS complex, the, the ventricles are being triggered by the AV node or the AV bundle entirely independently of the SA node and the, and the atria. So there's this there actually turns out there is kind of a rhythmic uh, nature to this thing, but um, in general, the, the, we know that the ventricles are being paced completely independently on their own, 
why that part of the intrinsic conduction system and the atria are being paced separately. Complete heart block. Now that's going to be a big problem. If we have heart block, right, we cannot pass signals down into the ventricles from the atria. Why is that going to be a problem? Because, first of all, the first thing that's kind of a problem is that the AV bundle, which is now going to take over pacing the ventricles, um, kind of doesn't start up right away. It hasn't been pacing the heart. It doesn't start pacing the heart for about a minute. So we've got a minute of time when your heart's not beating. How's that going to be? Not so good. It's going to lead to fainting. You're not going to have enough blood uh, flowing to the brain to, to deliver oxygen, and, you're, and your central nervous system is going to take a big hit, and you're probably going to faint. That's called syncope. Syncope is just a medical term for fainting. So we're talking about a, a pacing of 40 beats per minute or less in the, from the AV bundle. That's not going to be enough for virtually anyone, at rest even. It's not going to be enough blood flow. So we're going to have to do something about that. We're going to have to insert some wires right into the myocardium and connect them to a little, by way of a battery to a little oscillating electric circuit. An oscillator is just a circuit that creates an output, an electrical output on a periodic basis. And we can time our, our pacemaker, an electronic pacemaker, to shoot electrical charges down into the heart on a rhythmic basis. So people that have an electronic pacemaker depend on batteries to act, op, operate this circuit, which will take the place of the SA node. And there's complete heart block or some other injury to the, to the SA node. More arrhythmias. Another arrhythmia is called tachycardia. Anytime the heartbeat gets above around 100 beats per minute, that's called tachycardia. If it's during exercise, that's called exercise-associated tachycardia. That's perfectly normal, but it's still not the resting heart rate, so it's called tachycardia. If you have hyperthyroid, we've already said that thyroid hormone accentuates the effect, the effects of epinephrine and norepinephrine on the pacemaker in this case, increase the heart rate. Stress, heart disease, other things can cause tachycardia. Bradycardia means a slower than normal heart rate. Once the heart rate gets below around 60 beats per minute, that's called tech or bradycardia, I'm sorry, and people that to do a lot of aerobic exercise will have a resting heart rate possibly even in the 40s or the 50s that's called bradycardia but it can also be due to um, some abnormalities a drop in body temperature hypothermia certain drugs central nervous system depressants that will slow down the function of all of the neurons all the cells in your body and the heart um, so forth <clears throat> how about this concept what if some group of cells other than the SA node develop action potentials and trigger heart cycles. A group of cells that triggers a heart cycle out, from outside of the SA node of the intrinsic conduction system is called an ect ectopic focus. The heartbeat resulting from it is called an ectopic beat. Ectopic means not originating in the right spot. And the thing is, Without the intrinsic conduction system, the wave of depolarization spreads through the ventricles in a random way, not the normal pathway, and we have an inefficient result. We will not pump blood, not effectively. Right? The pathway of the wave of depolarization is going to take a different path. We will see um, the electrical activity on the electrocardiogram. We'll call it a premature ventricular contraction because an ectopic focus has jumped in ahead of the SA node and, and triggered a wave of depolarization in the ventricles. The problem is it doesn't pump blood. A lot of people have PVCs periodically, and it's perfectly normal. It's just the way their heart works. It just happens to. It's okay. But if someone has recently had a cardiac event, meaning a heart attack, a myocardial infarction, and their PVCs start happening, that's a bad sign. That'll trigger an alarm in the intensive care unit that goes right to the, to the main desk of the nurse's station because we need to go check on that patient promptly. Um, PVCs in someone that has recently had a heart injury may lead very quickly to uh, ventricular tachycardia, and then that can lead to fibrillation and death. So let's see, what in the world are we talking about? First of all, here's a PVC, an ectopic beat. The, the QRS complex should look like all these other beats right here. Those are normal those are normal heart cycles orchestrated by the intrinsic conduction system. Now an ectopic focus has triggered a random wave of depolarization through the heart, and we get this different looking peak. The reason the peak looks like it normally does is because of the intrinsic conduction system 
orchestrates the same path of depolarization every time. Now we have a different path. So a very, very different looking um, uh, waveform there. But also, again, that waveform indicates a non-effective, um, an ineffective uh, contraction of the heart muscle. We're not going to pump much blood out of any. Well, we're going to take a moment to define fibrillation before we go on to what should have been next. Ideally, we go right to talk about ventricular tachycardia, but we'll come back to that. That's the risk in someone who's just had a heart attack with see these PVCs. All right, what's fibrillation? We said that a pacemaker triggers an action potential which spreads through all the heart cells from, from, from intercalated disc to intercalated disc. Well, if all the heart muscle cells become dissociated uh, in time, unsynchronized, and they're all just having um, contractions at random times, then we have fibrillation. There's going to be no pumping at all. The heart is going to look like it's just writhing or wriggling. It's not beating. If that happens in the atria, then that means the atria are no longer going to contribute any pumping. But as it turns out, that's not really a problem because the ventricles do the majority of the pumping anyway, and we can do fine without the atria pumping. The big problem with atrial fibrillation, as you already know, is that we'll have blood stasis in those little wing-like auricles on the uh, lateral aspects of the, of the atria and clots will form there, emboli will break off and then uh, crash in the brain or the lungs and cause strokes or pulmonary embolisms. Very, very serious problems indeed. <clears throat> Often arrhythmias are treated with beta blockers, beta-1 adrenergic receptor antagonists, but to be more formal. Right? We said that epinephrine and norepinephrine work on the heart by, by binding to beta receptors, beta-1 receptors. If we kind of use an inhibitor to slow the back off on those beta-1 receptors, typically it'll settle down the heart cycle, the heart rhythm. <clears throat> we also would need some cubiting in the case of AFib to block uh, coagulation from happening in those, in those oracles. Ventricular fibrillation. If that happens, now we're in trouble. Now we're not pumping blood at all. <clears throat> there's no, there's this writhing of the ventricles, wriggling and writhing. Looks like a, people have likened it to a bag of worms. The, the pericardium is this, this fibrous sac, and inside it you can see the heart uh, underneath, and it's just wriggling and writhing. So um, you've got about three or four minutes of time to restore a rhythmic heart cycle, or the person probably will not survive. There's always a few stories of someone who fibrillated for a long, long time, and they were uh, recovered, and that was a miracle, so that's great. But in general, know that when someone enters ventricular fibrillation, or even VTAP, you don't have much time. You need to do something. So here's a picture of VTAC, ventricular tachycardia. Someone that had recently had a heart event, most likely, had started having more and more frequent PVCs, and pretty soon an ectopic focus has taken over the, the beating of the ventricles. It's a very fast uh, cycling that's happening due to that ectopic focus, and we have this very rapid heart rate only happening in the ventricles, the heart beats, the heart cycles, and it's not pumping any blood. So we've got a very dire situation. Even worse, that will very quickly lead in, a, in short order to ventricular fibrillation. Here's an a, 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 um, electrocardiogram of someone in ventricular fibrillation. Now we're really in deep trouble. We've got to resynchronize all those muscle cells. Um, how are we going to do that? We're going to do that by taking a, a, a capacitor, which is, a, which is an electronic device that can store electric charge, and then shoot the charge out of, those, out of a huge capacitor right into the body. What will happen is it will force all of these cells to be depolarized at once. This giant discharge of electrical activity into the body from the, from the, um, the external electrical defibrillator, it's called, will depolarize all of the cells. Then they'll be in the resting period, and then hopefully, with any luck, the SA node will be the first group of cells to start an action potential and restore the rhythm. That's the plan. That's the idea of an of an external uh, elect, uh, electronic defibrillator, EED. You see them in all over the place now because they're so effective in saving people from the results of ventricular fibrillation. You see them in the bank, you see them on the airplane, you see them in the, in the mall, they're everywhere because, and you should understand what they are and know how to use one because if someone uh, suddenly has a cardiac event like this, you can save their life and you've got no time to lose. All right. <clears throat> All right, now we got to make a careful distinction. Um, heart sounds, 
come from the closing of the heart valves slapping together the heart valves we've been looking at electrical activity of the heart now we're looking at something entirely mechanical we're going to look at the heart cycle in a bit in a different way and we'll emphasize the heart um the heart valves closing but first thing that happens during the heart cycle that we can hear with a stethoscope by auscultation is the closing of the AV valves when the ventricles contract. Then when the ventricles relax, the semilunar valves close. These two guys, the pulmonary artery valve and the aortic valve close. And, and the closing of the valves is like clapping your hands. It makes a violent, it makes a sound wave. That sound wave is dull, sort of like you trying to talk under the, under the surface of the swimming pool water. But nevertheless, you can hear it in a stethoscope, and it makes this muffled thumping sound, lucked up sound, so people often refer to it. <clears throat> so we have those two sounds that are routinely made. An expert in listening to the heart can actually hear the individual heart valves closed by positioning the stethoscope in these various positions. Right? If you want to hear the tricuspid valve most, most loudly, and position the stethoscope as in this yellow position and we'll, the first thing we'll be hearing is the tricuspid valve as well as the other ones. <clears throat> Let's define a heart murmur. A heart murmur is any sound besides that left up sound. Any other sound you hear in the stethoscope is defined as a heart murmur. So it doesn't refer to one uh, pathological condition. Um, there's a couple of things that cause a heart murmur. If a heart valve is leaking and there's pressure, a difference in pressure from one side of the valve to the other, blood will be shooting through that, that leak at a very high velocity producing a sound. Turbulent flow it's called and it produces a sound, a squeaking sound or a clicking sound depending on what the situation is. So let's say the AV valve is leaking and the ventricles are contracting, pushing blood up and out, but blood is shooting up into the atrium all at the same time then during the contraction of the heart, you'll also hear a funny sound instead of just the closing of the valves. And you'll hear closing and then a, then a, then a squeaky sound, perhaps. Or if one of the, eight, the uh, semilunar valves is, is leaky, then when the heart goes to rest, after you hear the second sound, you'll also then hear a squeaking sound or a, some kind of a, a whooshing sound that shouldn't be there. Those are called heart murmurs. So incompetent or insufficient leaky valves cause... Uh, heart murmurs, also stenosis. Stenosis means stiffening and scarring of the valve. An adjective made from stenosis is stenotic. If the valve is stenotic, that means it doesn't open properly. It's so stiff that it can't open. The valve can't get out of the way of the blood as it's trying to flow through. The blood has to be forced through at very high velocity, and it again causes turbulent flow. You can hear the turbulence in the stethoscope, and you now you have a heart murmur among other problems. Okay, so one last thing we should quickly look at. What about the external control of the heart? We've looked at the intrinsic conduction system, how it controls the heart cycle, it paces it, it orchestrates the, the pattern of depolarization of the muscle, um, but we also have external control of the heart cycle. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the parasympathetic nervous system, we see some neurons that are carried from the brain stem through the vagus nerve down to the SA node and AV node. The parasympathetic nervous system, I'll remind you that those neurons are, are, have post-ganglionic neurons right near the organ. So here we see the, 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 um, the, the ganglia. The post-ganglionic neurons release acetylcholine. Acetylcholine slows down the SA node and slows down the AV node. It's gonna reduce the heart rate. Sympathetic neurons in the lateral horn of the spinal cord gray matter in the thoracolumbar region, those, those preganglionic neurons enter into the, the, the chain ganglia, synapse with a postganglionic neuron, and those postganglionic neurons release norepinephrine onto the SA node and the AV node and increase the rate that they spontaneously depolarize, make them faster, increase the heart rate. Well, those sympathetic neurons also impinge on the heart muscle cells and cause them to, 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 to contract more vigorously. We've already seen that epinephrine and norepinephrine cause an increase in cyclic AMP in their target cells, a second messenger signaling system. But when that happens in a heart muscle cell, 
we're going to let more calcium into the cytoplasm and that's going to cause more firm and vigorous beats so the sympathetic nervous system as you've known for a long time causes increase in heart rate and an increase in the vigor of contraction so it can pump more blood to the exercising muscles <clears throat> So that's our story. So uh, join me next time for part three, and we'll talk a little bit more about some properties of the heart that help it fit into the whole picture of the cardiovascular system. And we'll also talk about um, some uh, pathological conditions in which the heart begins to weaken uh, in later life.